The early days of all the work on the opiates, it was all about finding a non-addictive painkiller. And then later, only later, and I've quoted a lot of people who've written about this, it's really about internal bliss. And I really believe, I mean, I, the first time I heard this, I was shocked and stunned. That was in, what was that, university where we were trapped in England for three weeks? What was that? Schumacher. Does anyone know Schumacher? It was wonderful. Boy, they made us work. We had to give hours of lectures every morning. They, we couldn't escape. <laughs> but um, at the shoot, what, why was I mentioning the Schumacher? <laughs> no, it's important. Yes, because the head of the college said, you know we're hardwired for bliss. I'm like, what? Of course we're hardwired for bliss. This is our natural state. Animal, you know, this is the way we're really meant to be. And all you, to, to, if you want to prove this scientifically, you can get off into a big analysis of the opiate receptor patterns, which have been done in great detail, not just in rats, but in humans. And what it looks like is the main control center of the brain that reaches down to every level, doesn't just control thoughts, but controls whether a particle of light will even start to go up into your consciousness or a movement, that control center is endorphinergic. It contains endorphins, it's squirting endorphins downward. Who knows where that control center is located? The ultimate control center. I'll give you a hint at the part that makes people different from chimpanzees. Right here, frontal, frontal cortex right behind your forehead, otherwise known as the third eye or whatever you want to call it. Because this part up here, it's, it's you, you know, chimpanzees have 99% plus of the same DNA as we do, but they don't have a frontal cortex. Now, what does the frontal cortex do? It allows us to consciously choose. up and maybe it got to the periaqueductal grape and there it was like oh wow this really hurts and then it got shunted further because it really was hot it was very hot it was much hotter than she expected then she gets it up to the thalamus and whoa that's really it's cooking this is bad something has to happen some remedy then the thalamus can take it all the way to the frontal cortex if it reaches the frontal cortex then and only then can she blame her husband. Okay. And that's how the brain works. And it's, you know, <laughs> thank you. Now you're a therapist. Do you agree with that? Can you, can you, can you, okay, good. <laughs> It's a joke, but there's something in there. So I don't want to go on too long. What else did I want to talk to you about? So you got the brain. You understand how the brain works? <laughs> it makes up stories. People, a lot of people have the same story for like so many years. That's awful. I mean, have you ever heard the expression, they're like renting space in their brain to people who have been dead for 35 years. Why do that? Why waste, why waste that precious real estate? Create new stories. So Yu's going to teach us how to um, meditate and why it can be working to slow things down enough to make the choices. Breathing, by the way, very important. There's another nodal point which is located right in your breathing center at the base of your brain. And um, I wanted to say something about the physics of emotion rather than the biochemistry of emotion. I, as I'm saying, it's much more of a vibration. It's much more of a vibration. And we are vibrating, and we are sending those vibrations out. Nobody is alone. We're all together. You know, what's interesting is think of this room as a crystal, you know, you were all a bunch of molecules. You wandered in and randomly sat down where you sat down. You know, you start, if you're really an extreme scientist and believe everything is controlled, you start to not believe in randomness. 
you start to believe that there are no accidents, that people are sending out vibrations, vibrations are coming in. Um, I just wanted to say something about Abby Rosen for a minute because it'll come, I'm going to lead around to it and her, she, uh, Abby is the, the co-chair of the committee that founds and governs uh, Sanctuary. And she's also one of the most renowned therapists in a therapy called Voice Dialogue, which to me has been in the past, and it's kind of a leading edge therapy because it recognizes that people are a bundle of frequencies, just like white light. People are white light. You know, white light is the sum of all the different frequencies in the rainbow. And people show, in case you haven't noticed, different sides in different situations to different people. Nobody is the same all the time. I mean, and even the dark side is a gross oversimplification. What triggers these different behaviors, memories, body postures, emotions, or psychoactive drugs? Either one. You can imagine which is... Which do you think is a little more natural and potentially more life-fulfilling? Probably the former. But, I mean, who am I to say? I spent years developing, you know, with my students, neuropharmacological agents that maybe they're not all they were cracked up to be originally. Maybe people are starting to take a second look at them. Maybe all the, far the big farmers are closing down their research departments on neuropsychiatric drugs before they all get sued out of business. Um, you know, th these are the things that are starting to happen on the horizon. Uh, but anyway, so the physics of emotion is that you really got to get the vibrational frequency in there, and you have to stop thinking of the body as a hunk of meat. And you have to stop thinking of the receptors. As much as I love them, they're not little bowling balls with holes in them. They're winding and unwinding. They're vibrating, some of them very fast, they literally hum, they make music. It is through the music that they make that they affect the other cells uh, in the body. So with that, everybody should take, this is, we are in church after all, take 45 seconds to talk to the person next to you and find out why, you're, why the universe brought you to be sitting down next to that person. <laughs> I just have uh, one last point to make, and then we can close on this um, uh, a musical lecture meditation. I have this uh, little CD that I made with my son that's not sold anywhere except on my website. It's just it's a little folly that's fun because I'm at the point where I almost can't explain things except through music. You know, you sort of get to that point, and uh, you're almost like beyond the, you know, the the, the hardwired. Paradigm. There is nothing hardwired. But I wanted to close uh, with this term synchrodestiny. Have you heard this term synchrodestiny? Well, you've heard of synchronicity, and that uh, I used to think it was Jung, Carl Jung invented it, but actually he was working with the physicists, the early quantum theorists of the day when he was thinking about this. I wrote a lot about the synchronicity in. Uh, the book that I wrote just a few years ago where it was more going, you know, as you do, as scientists do when they get older and they go off the spiritual deep end. Um, <laughs> but I was very annoyed by all these brilliant uh, scientists who are writing these books about how there is no God because, like, everyone knows just logically in science, by philosophy of science, you can never disprove anything. You can only prove something. So, I mean, just by that logical fallacy alone. But for me, the best evidence of, some people hate the word God, or call it, you know, the universal force, whatever. There's something going on. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> okay. So, to me, it's this, uh, the synchronicities, that billion things that happen with billion to one coincidences. But what you're supposed to do is to ride that. Synchrodestiny means don't just say, oh, isn't that funny? Look at that. That bird is the same bird from my mother's house. Wonder what it means and use it and pay attention to it because it's something that 
you can you can follow through. So going back to over a year ago when I was at the um, sanctuary for the first time at this amazing event, the people that I got to sit with, Abby Rosen, uh, Judy, who I did not become friendly with, thank God. We won't go there. <laughs> You can meet Mike afterwards. <laughs> Pardon? She's a divorce attorney. But we won't go there. We've said we weren't going to go. <laughs> Just add the sanctuary, add Abby Rosen to the growing list of therapists that have saved the rough and perk collaboration so we can cure all the diseases in the world. But... The synchro destiny idea is huge, so follow it. So I just want to, I'm going to give away the ending of the second book because it still blows my mind. And to me, it's proof that that book had to have been written the way it was written. So the person who popularized uh, synchro destiny is Deepak Chopra, who is also an acceptable spiritual leader because he's got an MD from Harvard. I mean, really, how can you argue with that? And plus he's Indian, so we got a little of that <laughs> going on. And I met Deepak many, many years ago. He's been a major friend and influence on my life. And he says I've helped him with the science. And years ago, when Mike and I, it had only been a few years since we had invented this AIDS drug, where we had deduced the exact part of the virus that enters and infects the cells, a small little piece, and you can use it as the drug and use it as the vaccine. And I was at a conference with him, and I'm like, What's going on? We've got it. It's so good. We've done this great research. We've published in the right journals. I've done everything possible. What, what am I doing wrong, Deepak? And he said, you're trying too hard. <laughs> that was the most revolutionary thing I ever had. You all think about that. It's a weird, elusive thing, trying hard and effortlessness. Try to effortlessly cultivate effortlessness. Okay? So, so Deepak wrote the introduction to Molecules of Emotion, which was wonderful. And then just as we were literally sitting in a little airport in California, that would be Mike B. and Nancy Marriott, my co-author, saying, how are we going to end the book? This is the second book. We know the book's over. We need you to give it a good ending. And at that moment, Mike goes, isn't that Deepak Chopra right there? And sure enough, we were like between planes, and we all hugged and said hello. So it was the weirdest thing. The introduction to the first book, the ending to the second book, bookends. And, I mean, come on, there's, that's a billion to one coincidence. So now I sometimes read that book that I, quote, wrote, you know, because remember this thing about altered states of consciousness? each with its own memories. This is a very important point. This has been proven by a thousand uh, learning theory, behavioral psychology experiments. You can't even remember the good times when you're in the bad times. You don't even remember them. You know, every, that's what these peptides do. That's what these receptors throughout your body and mind do. They, they allow you to gain access or not gain a access. And so... You know, you really want to um, think about that a little. Okay, and now instead of, uh, you know, let's segue. I really appreciate this wonderful audience of friends and new friends and locals. Are we cool in Montgomery County or what? And I thank you for your attention. And if, 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 if things worked, if, the pers if you're able to put on this little uh, piece that takes about five minutes that you could listen to, or you could start to segue into the ladies' room uh, as, you, as you see fit. Thank you again for your intention. I look forward to the rest of the day.